Hello, uh, this is the On the Rise podcast, uh, where we'll be talking about uh, various Emberwind related topics and having interviews with people within the Emberwind community. Um, we have the two hosts, uh, myself, uh, Aiden, and we also have uh, the other host here, uh, Louis. What's going on? What's going on? And then today we have a special guest, uh, Mildred the Monk. Hello. Now, I think, right, I love this because not only that, it's our first interview, but we literally get somebody with the, you know, with Monk in their name. And I got to tell you, Mildred, right, I've been waiting to tell you this for like the last 20 minutes, but I'm a big martial arts fan, man. I love martial arts. So I'm hoping that somehow my love of martial arts and your name are faded. <laughs> some type of conversation. Um, we'll see, we'll see how, we'll see how things go. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. It gives me hope. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Mildred, could you tell us a bit about yourself and, uh, what kind of things you do? Well, as is kind of indicated by my name, I, I style myself as the gaming monk. Um, I, for the better part of seven years, I've been do I've been running, um, a channel with with my name and the podcast, The Monastery, that focuses on reviewing. It started out as just me reviewing TTRPGs. I had one little dip in reviewing video games. I didn't like how it turned out, so I didn't do that for a while. Um, covering news, la laughing at laughing at stupidity. Um, occasionally covering sport, occasionally covering sports and other matters. We, in its current incarnation, on Fridays. We do a show called The Valley of the Judge, where we're doing a part-by-part um, -part deep dive into a, into a given core book for, for various games. Uh, sometimes we do a full book. Sometimes we do a one-off, like a quick start or the like. Uh, on Sundays, I do Geek Watch, which is a topic-centric podcast that covers a variety of things. Sometimes... Sometimes we go into talking about writing, sometimes game design, sometimes um, roasting a lot, roasting alive certain certain people in in various creative fields. Uh, and I do a lot of interviews with a lot of developers of all sorts, as well as as well as a few voice actors. If any of you are fans of Evangelion, I've had the voice of Shinji um, Spike Spencer on the show twice. Okay. Okay, Spike Spencer. I like oh, it. Nice. Name dropping. Um, Amazing. He's a, he's a good guy. He's a bit he's a bit of a goof though. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> he he is the reason why there's a bottle of Australian wine in the in the in the back of my closet. <laughs> hey man. Oh, um, I didn't even know they made wine in Australia. I learn something new every day. Yeah. But I've also had. Um, John Swayze on if you're uh, and he what he's mostly known for is be is a lot of times being the anime dad in mm -hmm. Old Metal Alchemist Brotherhood he was the voice of Hohenheim oh oh nice uh, and I guess because they didn't want to bring back Scott McNeil for the role because well Scott McNeil's in everything true true include including my drinking habits occasionally <laughs> I have to well. blame him. I have to blame him for the fact that I've even had Corona. Man, that's a lot. To, yeah, that's a lot for that man to carry on his shoulders. You want to do him like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the but I've I've had I've done. There's been a lot that I've had under the belts. In fact, if I look at the um, let me see let me see what that count is at as far as my interviews. Yeah, I, I um, looked earlier before <laughs> this, and I saw that you had a ton of interviews. I was like, yeah, over the, 600? Yeah, it, I was we're, I'm just a few. By the end of the week, I will probably end up having 666. Mm. Ah. Lucky um, number, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. Not too long ago, we finished the we finished the seventh season of Valley of the Judged, which was on Convictor Drive, which is mm. an interesting beast. And I'm always going to jump at the chance at exploring more when it comes to um, Japanese tabletop. Because it because it's jumping into Japanese tabletop is is like jumping into a whole new a whole new culture. 
would you say it's different? Like it's it, is it just completely different mechanical or um it does depend on the kind of game you're dealing with, but the reason I say a different culture is a lot of games are not are not built for campaign design. Mostly this is mostly because of the fact that a lot of times games end up getting played at um rooms and rooms and karaoke bars and the, and the like. Mm-hmm. So it's it meant to be meant to be more one-shot affairs or some or semi-episodic. There are of course exceptions, the big one being um Sword World which is the biggest homegrown TTRPG in Japan. One that was one of my white whales as far as ones I'd like to study, but I did, but I didn't think I'd get the chance until about ten months ago when I saw when I found out about a group of, a group of fan translators who have been working on that and not only got the the core books handled, but several of the expansion books, a few replays. Um, replays are are kind of like actual plays in book form, and predate actual plays by several years mm. and they've and they have made inroads on doing this on doing the same with the updated version um sword world 2.5 um this sword world was used as the basis for the um goblin slayer ttrpg that was recently put out but that was recently translated by yen press and what I found, what I found funny is a lot of people were asking, "Why didn't they use D and D for this?" The reason is D and D is not as popular in Japan. I know that D and D is referenced in the light novel for Goblin Slayer, but fact still stands. It's yeah. the same. It's the same reason you're not, you're going to see more people playing um, Das Schwarz Anga in Germany than playing D and D, or for us English speakers, The Dark Eye. Yeah, it's easy. I, I've played a couple of these. Of uh, Japanese ones, uh, there was one I don't remember the name of, but the one that I do is Kamigakuri. Yeah, Kamigakuri. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, we I, I played that. I um, that was one of those. Ca- that was one of those cases where I was glad I was patient, given how long it took after I backed it. Um, uh, but I've I've dipped I've dipped into that one, as well as stuff like Double Cross made um Tenra Bancho Zero, which is one of my favorites. Um, Shinobi Gami, and um, the Log Horizon TTRPG, even if that was through a fan, pro- even if that was fan translated, and um, Nova, which was also fan translated and used a playing card motif. Okay. Which, so I got. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. I got a question for you, Major, if you don't mind. So you know you're very knowledgeable, mm-hmm. and I love that, bro. Right? Because it means I can pick your brain. I can ask you some serious questions. You know what I mean? Them deep doubt, gritty character questions. So when you're stuck, you know what I mean? When you just need s- some juice going, you know what I mean? Trying to trying to get it going. What's your what's your go-to snack or like activity? Like what do you do to get them them juices flowing? You know? Are you a pop tart kind of guy? Or are you more of like you know milk or what do you do? Um, as far as far as as far as snacks go, um, a lot a lot of fruit. <laughs> Okay. All right. A lot of a lot of fruit. I will I will make my own sa- I will make my own salads. Okay. Um, I I'm not re- I'm not re- um I'm not really I'm not really a snack food guy in the traditional mm-hmm. sense. A lot of it is due to the fact that I have a crippling allergy to chocolate, so a lot of sna- a lot of snack foods I can't have. Period. Um, Oof! I know that would kill some people. Uh, yeah. So no, no it buddy buddies. Sure. It won't it won't kill me. I'll just wish it did. And Oh no, no. I was talking about the people not being able to eat chocolate for sure. Like like for sure, you dying is terrible, but I'm sure some people not, you know, just not be the chocolate. Oh. Just, oh my goodness, you know. There's there's um there's certain protein bars that that I will go that I will go to. Um if I if I can't if I can't go the healthy route, um I'm a big sucker for root beer. <laughs> um and if I need to go to I, yeah, if I need to go, the thing the thing is though, when it comes to root beer, it my rule is anything but A and W. I don't like A and W. What's with the 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 whole you know antagonistic nature with A and W? It's too sweet. Uh, see, I, I think A and W is one of my favorites. So, <sighs> hot take twenty twenty three. Um, if I have, to, usually usually I will go I will go with more local ki- kinds of root beer if I if I can. 
if I have to go with the bigger stuff, um, and actually, I'm a little, I'm, I'm a little bit harsh on A and W. A and W is like second place. The one that I'm like absolutely no is um, Mug. That's the one that's too sweet. So when you mean local, do you mean like there's a whole like micro economy of people making homemade root beers and selling them like on the side? I'm, I mean the, I mean the small, I mean the smaller ones, and obviously. Okay. Coming coming from where I where I do, um, if I can get away with sarsaparilla, I will. I know I'm dating myself with that, but I don't <laughs> care. Um, Jones makes a makes a pretty decent root beer, and if you if you go in, if you go into some some small some small time or specialty stores, you can always find some something that's going to work. Um, but if I have to go if I have to if I'm on the road and I have to go with one of the bigger names, I can always rely on um, Barks. Okay. All right. I, I, I was just concerned, man, because what you said, it sounded like, you know, folks was posted up on the street, you know, real <laughs> deal in this, no. in this root beer war out here in these streets. <laughs> um, I was like, dang, I, I didn't know it was am, like that. I didn't know the culture was like that. I am big on, I am big on lemonade. Um, okay. But I, but um, when it, but when it comes to lemonade, I don't like, I don't like it too sweet. I need I need some tang in that. If I want if I mm. want something sweet, I wouldn't be drinking lemonade. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. I need some tang. I, I absolutely can't stand that min, that minute made stuff because I can taste the powder. Uh. Yeah, you know, there's nothing like a uh, on a hot day drinking a nice drink and getting a mouthful mm -hmm. of powder. Yeah. Um, <sighs> of course, of course, on a, on occasion, I, on occasion, I will go with I will go with more adult beverages because. I'm in the mid. I'm in the Midwest, and everybody knows at least one local brew. <laughs> local brew. Oh yeah, man. I feel you. I'm a. I'm a. I consider myself a vintage drinker myself. I'm a big fan of that Mike's Harder Lemonade. Yeah, I know, big boy stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, there's also this. There's also this thing called. Um, the full name is like not your grandfather's root beer, but everybody just calls it. Everybody just calls it Gramps. Um, Gramps it is. It is basically an alcoholic version of root beer. Yeah, I think I've seen that around. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. It's not bad. It's think. It's thankfully not that sweet. Which problem with sweet root sweet root beer is um, it it just it just ends it up ends up feeling like a poor man's coke. Mm hmm. Oh man, he's shooting some real fire here. <laughs> Over yeah. here. <laughs> so to to get us back a little bit on uh, topic, uh, a little bit more. Um, so. Uh, I was curious of what got you into Emberwind and like what, you know, how did you get into the community and find the game? Well, if you look, if you look back in my archives, you'll see that I did a, I did a review of it um, a few years before I did the Valley of the Judge series of episodes. Um, around that, around that time, around the time that I found, that I found out about Emberwind, I was doing research on games that had the DNA of D and D Fourth Edition, but did not have the exact rule set, and a few other examples of this were Strike, which appa apparently the creator of had ended up pissing off a lot of people because he because he kept spamming it on various um, forums. Mm -hmm. um, Unchained Heroes, which made made me think of Grandia because of how it handles initiative. Thirteenth Age, which um, is one is probably the biggest of these, and Emberwind, and okay. the and um some and so all all four of those I had pl I had played or or done campaigns for in one in one form or another. Um, initially, I had just done a one shot with Emberwind when I was doing one shots with all of them. And then I spent some more time to get to get a little bit more familiar with things. And when I started doing the Valley of the Judge series, uh, I, f I felt that using Emberwind would be a nice, nice bit, nice bit of contrast compared to the, compared to the some of the earlier stuff that we had that we had done. Plus, I think around that time we had just finished up Veil of the Void, and we wanted to do something fantasy again. And that was and that was the one I ended up picking because I put all of the potential ones on a wheel and see and decide to see where it landed. Okay. 
Uh, so like were it. you, were you, uh, did you get into it like during the, the, the Kickstarter or was it after that? Uh, it was, I don't remember. it was, a, it was at least a year after the Kickstarter. Okay. Although the, yeah, so you've been here for quite a while mm -hmm. then. I've only been in the Discord server per se more recently. <clears throat> but in terms of being aware of em of Emberwind, um that that's been that's been for quite some time and I ha I have a little um index that I made on Shrivener to kind of, to kind of combine um a lot of the material that was split over that was split over various PDFs. Uh, this includes all of the subclasses that have been released so far. Okay. Um, speaking of the subclasses, I want to talk to you um, just a bit about the monk. Uh, before we actually get like deep into it, I got to ask, man. Um, monk's in your name. You made the monk. Um, what's the martial arts inspirations that you had? You know, um, I guess for your name and also like for the character, like did you specifically go off, you know, some main pieces of, of media, maybe some things you saw as a kid or growing up, you know, I want to hear it. Well, martial arts and I have been, ha have been hand in hand since I was a little kid. Um, I grew up a Power Rangers kid as every, as every other kid did during the nineties when there was the whole debate about whether you were a Power Rangers kid or a Batman kid. I was the one saying, screw you. I'm taking both. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I, I had got, I had got into, I w um, on a kid. Obviously, I got, I had gotten into wrestling. Although, um, a lot of people would assume that I got into wrestling through, um, WWF or WCW. No, mm -hmm. <clears throat> my earliest wrestling memories are watching these old AWA tapes from from the seventies and eighties. And okay. Beyond that, I I always had a I always had a much bigger interest in the wrestling scene in um in Mexico and in Japan. Like there there are plenty of there are plenty of matches that I had seen in, from um AAA and um as well as well as the as well as the big two of um New Japan and Old Japan and then later on Pro Wrestling Noah, which is oh yeah yeah um I remember growing up when they had um uh, Blue Demon fight in Japan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I I will I will admit that one th one particular thing that I learned is bad American wrestling is nowhere near as bad as bad lucha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're you're right. I I um a few years ago I I ended up watch for whatever reason I ended up watching um um eighty aniversario from CMLL. And <laughs> this, the the best, the the best way for me to describe it is the old is, the main event was the old man show, <laughs> but the but the best um pre the best encapsulation of how old everybody was in it was one of the competitors um Mascara Año Dos Mil. Mas oh my! Mask of the Year two thousand. This yeah, match yeah. took place in 2016, and he has no mask. All right, man. Look, he had that real Ember One spirit. He's trying to do his <laughs> thing, man. <laughs> he was doing his thing. But um, so, uh, so for like the monk class itself, right? So like, mm -hmm. uh, when you were making the monk class, like in your head, right? Like, did you use uh, maybe a particular movie or like uh, or like media or medium, I should say? Whenever I whenever I make something that is based on a, that is based on a particular thing. It is never one bit of inspiration. It's always a grab bag that I that I mix that I mix until I can have a vertical slice of what of what I need. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I should clarify that I didn't call it a monk. I called it a pugilist. And the reason why I did the reason why I did this was because mm -hmm. um, I felt I felt that if somebody wanted to do the spiritual leaning monk. Mm -hmm. That's already covered in Emberwind. The sole reason I made yeah. it was because I felt I felt that there wasn't enough martial arts in the in um in that particular cat in that particular class. So if you want something, if you want to get something done, you got to do it yourself. And that was why I created Big the fan. Pugilist. 
I like it. I like it, man. I'm actually a big uh, martial arts fan myself. Aiden will tell you, I, um, I boxed for many years uh, when I was a kid. So mm-hmm. as soon as Aiden told me about the pugilist, he had to believe that it was uh, the only class I would uh, I would, I would pick. But uh, <laughs> the, other, the other thing I need to make clear is one of the things that I did not want to do is mm-hmm. build is build it with an build it with an assumption of what sort of martial arts style um you're go- it was going to use because if you if you look mm-hmm. at let's use the D D monk um mm-hmm. one of the two two major inspirations for that particular monk was the kung fu tv show that bruce lee was in and the destroyer novels from back from back in the back in the 60s and 70s. Okay. And as nice as those are, the pro- the problem is that's representing one martial arts style. Mm-hmm. And there would be plenty of times where I would be running a campaign and somebody would be playing a somebody would be playing a monk, but they didn't want to do kung fu. They wanted to do mm-hmm. say capoeira, they wanted to do shotokan. Yeah, they, wa- yeah. they wanted to do mu- muay thai. Um mm-hmm. Or, or they want, or um, they wanted to do savat, or, or, mm-hmm. um, or, e- or even wanting to do a more, M- a more MMA or um, sambo, if you're familiar with that. Yeah, 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 mental sambo, Russian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, this is all uh, Louis area. I'm like, like yeah. I don't know anything about monks or fighting or anything but like the, that. The point so. is, mm-hmm. I wanted it to have that. Un- I wanted to have that unarmed fantasy. Mm-hmm. But not have it be not have there be an assumption of what kind of uh, martial arts style that it that it's being used. I wanted to leave that I wanted to leave that up to the individual player. That's why in the document that I put I put in that aside that originally was going to be using um set, was going to be using a few examples of martial arts for each for each of the weapon reskins that I did for it. Mm-hmm. But as I further developed, as I further developed it, I realized no, this is not the best approach. I need to do something a bit more universal. So I leaned towards elements, which does carry the assumption that it's that it's doing elemental stuff, like you're doing bending. But yeah, that, that was that, something I had noticed was that it seems to be like I don't know if it was like inspired by Avatar or something because I know they do a lot mm-hmm. of martial arts and stuff there. Well, and, yeah. I will. I will admit. Um, Avat- a lot of people, um, when they look, when they look at Avatar, they, 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 end- they don't end up realizing that they're, wa- that they're watching a wuxia story and not mm-hmm. realizing it. But I will, I will note that if there's anything I could take from Avatar, it's, it's the fact that all of the bending styles are based on a different martial arts style. Oh Air yeah, for sure. is based on Bagua Zhong. Mm-hmm. Um, firebending is based on Northern Shaolin. Um, Earthbending is based on Hungar, except for um, Toph style, which is based on Southern Praying Mantis. And Waterbending is based on Tai Chi. Um, this is something that kind of got dialed back with Legend of Korra, but that's a topic I've co- I've covered mm-hmm. on my channel when I did the reconstruction of Legend of Korra, which I think I think I did a better job than the actual show did. <laughs> <laughs> but. but but the the point is 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 that I went with the I went with the elements in that particular in that particular case because elements are something that is going to be universal. Now, if if down the if down the road a setting book for Emberwind is ever released, I may amend that to bet to better integrate with it. But so far, that isn't the case. So I'm going with I'm going with elements as a universalist thing because everybody's familiar with, with on some level the hellenistic elements mm-hmm. um, and i used sp- i used spirit to represent the fifth element which was known as ether or yeah in um in alchemy or void in J- in the japanese elements mm-hmm. about that go ahead I think no, it works so pretty well, you know, like how you were saying, you know, like you don't want anyone to be like just one definitive style, right? Because I understand, you know, like what you're saying, uh, because I play like a lot of martial arts characters myself, and a lot of people just think, hey, it's just, it's just one way, you know? Um, but I I mean, uh, uh, I think the element thing kind of works even more, because, um, so you've like wrestled and done martial arts and stuff yourself, right? 
I have, I have, I have done, I have dabbled in wrestling. I've dabbled yeah. in fencing, and I've, I've had my encounters um, in the SCA, the Society yeah. for Creative Anachronism. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, like even the terms they sell, uh, the terms themselves that they use, like you know, like within like the fight and sport culture, like actually use the elements. You know what I mean? Like if someone has hot hands, you know what I mean? They're real quick, they're real fast, they're very aggressive. You know what I mean? Like. Mm -hmm. You know, like Firebender would be. You know what I mean? He has a hand and body of stone. You know, that means that that guy, he's not the fastest puncher. But if he touches you, it's going to connect. It's going to hit. And if you hit him, you know, you better, you know, do what it do. Hell, uh, biggest thing was uh, Muhammad Ali. Float like butterfly, sting like a bee, man. Boxing 101. Be the air. Move around him. Make him yeah. dance a little bit. Um, the, the running gag I've, al I've always had whenever I hear that I know Kung Fu line from the, ma from the Matrix is, yeah. okay, okay, which one? <laughs> like, oh, it was a good show. <laughs> no, ser no, seriously, seriously, which one? There's like 1,500 different versions of Kung Fu. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I, I didn't know any of this. I'm just kind of learning as we talk. So, mm -hmm. hey, man, look, you come for the ember when you stay for the martial arts now. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But these. The other th the other thing that I wanted to lean into is some of the things I liked with the monk in. Um, D and D fourth edition, which actually has one of my favorite iterations of the of the monk within just the D and D space. Plus, uh, plus I've I've jokingly referred to fourth edition as the edition I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because the check didn't clear. I right, understand that completely. <laughs> yeah, I haven't played fourth edition either. Um, that was one that like my group just never wanted to play, pretty much. Uh, I think Louie has played actually with uh, with that same group that I'm talking about, but that was like yeah, we've done it once or twice. It it, it wasn't bad. Somebody when we were playing got real. So apparently, like you can do a lot of broken stuff in fourth edition, man. And somebody got real mad that like someone cast some kind of fireball and it killed off an entire room. You can do and, you can do broken stuff in every edition. <laughs> uh, just, just, just this particular time, I guess it made him more saltier than others, man. And uh, man, he was salty. <laughs> yeah, that sounds, that sounds like the exact kind of person who would spend who would spend hours on end try, trying to ex trying to explain to me how there is nothing wrong with the, with their with their cleric that can that can somehow act like an entire party all by themselves. Mm. No, over right here. Huh? Preaching to the choir here. Preaching to the choir, baby. We have a we have, there's a term we use in the temple called Codzilla. Mm -hmm. The cod stands for cleric or druid. This is also mm -hmm. known as playing D D on easy mode, because especially in third, this isn't a this this is at this um ended up getting shifted to cleric or warlock in um fifth edition. Mm -hmm. But the point is, though the point is those particular those particular characters. Somebody who knows what they're doing is an entire party all to themselves. Yeah, and I and um the thing that was all the thing that was always hilarious to me was the same people who argue that there's nothing wrong with that were reing <laughs> were, were reing like 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 somebody on the short bus at the at the mere notion of the martial characters getting stuff to do when Tome of Battle came out. <laughs> I know like how, I, how it was stepping onto stepping onto the um the, the turf of um casters and and I was like you guys have access to knock which pretty much makes thieves pointless. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about, Brett. <laughs> Last houses is all I'm saying. Yeah, we got a couple players uh, I've played with before that are like that where they have an entire party to themselves kind of thing. Um, like if, if you're gonna do if you're gonna do that, then just own it. Don't don't twist yourselves into knots trying to tell me that do that doing three d ten damage in four, in four attacks per turn is somehow balanced because you have a nine in charisma or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean the good thing I think with Emberwind is it's a lot harder to do that since it's kind of based around comboing with uh, the other members in your party. Um, I don't know it, what you'd think, but it's. I'd say I'd say there's that, and there's there's also there's also the fact that there's not there's not re 
the kind the kind of benefits that you would get from attempting to min max are very minimal. Like you might you might be able to do you might be able to do that if especially if you're picking um attribute style instead of aspect style. But the amount of benefits that you're going to get for all the hoops that you're going through aren't really worth it, especially once mm -hmm. you go up and especially once you go up in tiers. And yeah. The other the other thing is that no matter how no matter how good no matter how um how high tier you are, everybody still has the same amount of slots. Yeah. In that regard, I'd I liken um Emberwind's approach to an arena shooter. Mm -hmm. Your your quakes, your un, your unreals. Um, if I'd use a more recent example, Splitgate, mm -hmm. um, even. Um, Halo to a lesser extent, mm -hmm. because, and this is the reason why I always prefer to why I always preferred arena shooters to the to the to the CODs and the COD wannabes. Everybody start. Everybody starts with the same blank template, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what separates the amateurs from the pros is understanding how the map works and how to take advantage of how the map works. Especially, yeah, especially when it comes to um, things like power weapons. Um, I remember, yeah. I remember playing Halo Two and a lot, and some people complaining about about um, B, about um, BXR or the, or even Double Shot. Those were a couple infamous exploits at the time. But if you don't have the timing down, Pat, you're going to leave yourself wide open. And there's a similar thing with the infamy that was the pistol in Combat Evolved, but you have to lead your shots. So if you so again it takes it takes practice to actually take advantage of the infamous three shot that the pistol had with combat evolved. But ev but everybody can do it in theory. Like, there's all the stuff that you can do in Emberwind. Mm -hmm. But in but in practice figuring out the trick the tricky part is going to be figuring out the how. You know, and um, I I sometimes like figuring out the how, right? Like, um, just especially like the how to play or like, you know, like how can I get like what's in front of me? Because my favorite thing to do uh, is, I don't know if you're a fan Mildred, but I love rolling for characters, right? I, I love that, that objectivity of like randomness because I love playing with what you have. Because uh, I feel like if you make something too strong or like just something too broken, it loses the spirit of the game for me, right? So I'm a big fan for that. I don't um, have to do that much with with Ember when like the random thing because like you said it's like the blank slate you know what I mean it's all about like, you know like how you pick it and and then even if I do pick something that could be quote unquote bad right like there's still a lot of you know opportunity for me to have quite a bit of fun with it. When it I mean, comes to random creation, my my approach has always been it depends on the game I'm running or or the game that I'm in. Um, if I'm doing say Warhammer Fantasy. Or, or even the um, Warhammer 40k um, role-playing games that were put out by Fantasy Flight and the more recent one by Cubicle Seven. The approach, th the approach that I end up taking is is that is one is one where you can where you should be doing doing randomization. The game outright encourages it, but if I'm doing something like say Hero System or GURPS. Or um, mutants and masterminds, I'd be a little less inclined to go with randomness. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel you just due to the nature of the system too, because mm -hmm. you don't want to. You know, obviously, heroes and masterminds, you start rolling crazy, you you get a little wonky. But well, I mean, super is in universal games. You have to, you have to be careful, otherwise things are going to go off the rails no matter what. So. Oh yeah, definitely. It's not something I hold against e either one of those games. It's it's a it's something that you get what you pay for when you're dealing with those with that kind of game. You're not nobody's picking up um, Hero System expecting to play a beer and pretzels game. Yeah. So um, I meant to ask earlier, um, what was like your aha moment when you were developing like the Pugilist, like when you were playing or when you were looking it over? What when you were like? Just like, oh, like, damn, like, yeah, that's, you know, that's, 
that's that's it. That is that is what you know. I need to add to this. You know, to the game. What like, do you remember that moment, or you just kind of just as it kind of just kind of like fused together for you? Um, the first thing that the first thing that came to mind was was what was um the was what I wrote as the class features: style expertise, internal external energy expertise, and internal energy expertise. Because in order to in order to see if I could get see if I could get an idea, I was reading through some of the Wuxia themed RPGs that I have, stuff like Kill the Buddha, Legends of the Wu Lin, Lone Wolf Fists, that sort of thing. Yeah, 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 um, I get you. Full full disclosure: the developer of Lone Wolf Fists is a friend is a friend of mine. <laughs> okay, and. So, I would say it's some it's somebody who I've had who I've had on my show, but that doesn't. <laughs> but given how many people I've had on my show, that doesn't exactly say a whole yeah. lot. But I would say I would say one of the big aha moments was what was um was was when I was when I was looking at the internal and external kung fu that's used in legends of the woolen and i realized i could use that i could use that along with the um limited action system the sat as i as i call it sustain amplify trigger and you and use that as a basis to to build around the other th the other thing that was a that that helped was replaying jade empire Specifically, the in style mod that almost tur almost turns it into a whole new game. I know what you're I, about. I, I, it really does. It really does add to a whole new slew of options. So the so I had them. I had the mindset of instead of instead of trying to look at this as as the character is um, the pugilist is a student of one style. No, they're a student of of one style as a basis. And taking in elements from other styles, which is something you see a lot in Wuxia. There, a, char a character in a lot of Wuxia stories is never someone who studies one one particular style. There's somebody and uses that style exclusively. They may have they may use that as their foundation, but they'll take little little um, nudges that they see from other styles mm -hmm. in their journey. Um, if you want to hear something interesting, right? Because what you mm -hmm. said just prompted me. It's you know, it's a martial arts question talking about the, the stuff. Um, you know how you know you take small pieces and you add it, you know, to eventually make your own style, right? Mm -hmm. So, in the uh, correction system, right in America, in the prisons and jails and stuff, there's this thing called Fifty Two Blocks. Have you heard about this? No. Okay, so it's called Fifty Two Blocks Jailhouse Rock, right? Different different folks call it different names, but it's pretty much. The same thing, right? You have OGs, you know, original gangsters or, you know, people blessed in. They've been doing the game for a while, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they get pretty nifty with their hands and they've been fighting for so long and fought so many people and they've taken so many things. They develop like their own style that is pretty effective against most most things you would encounter. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's crazy, right, that uh, that... You know that this kind of thing develops in like a super closed environment where you think no one would have anything. You know what I mean? But you have like such sophistication uh, with like techniques, grapples, like some things you would see at like some high level uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitions. Man, are done by some of these guys sometimes, and you're like, wow, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that man's a real master. <laughs> that man has some real potential. Mm -hmm. And now I. I will I will admit I did the when it came to part of the a couple of the things that I added when it came to the pu, the pugilist the weaponless hero optional rule and wall damage those were to fill were to fill in gaps that I f I felt I needed to for the class fantasy I know I use that phrase a lot but that's a big thing in design for me mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah completely. Yeah, I know we've talked about uh, some of that as well. Uh, we we agree the, and disagree, but you know. yeah, the, the weaponless hero optional rule that was that was to account for the fact that most people, when they're playing a monk or a pugilist in this case, they have they have the idea in their head of this is somebody who's a master of unarmed combat. Well, Emberwind doesn't really have a one a unarmed option within the within the hero manual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the approach that I this and this is why it's 
the idea of turning that into martial arts styles was something that I had already done previously with a OSR adjacent game called Adventure Conqueror King System. Um, especially, especially since, unlike a lot of um, OSR games and even some non-OSR games, that that particular system in what in the player's companion actually has rules to allow you to create a class. Which is it was one of those cases where I'm like, why haven't why don't more games do this? Especially more class based games. So people are gonna house rule no matter what, so you may as well give them a um got a set of guidelines on on how to do it so that it fits. This man speaking the truth over I, here. I, I will say to that, um mm-hmm. The I don't know if you've seen the post on the Ember Wind SRD, um, but I'm kind of uh, been working on writing that, and I will tell you that I'll, I'll that there will be guides on how to build classes because, like for example, the Rise system itself doesn't actually include classes. The classes are part of Ember Wind and not the Rise system mm-hmm. that it's built on, and so there will be you know different like guidelines and ways to to build characters yeah. um or classes and such um uh, i will ad- i will admit when it came to the offhand items that was the the two things that were trickiest with weaponless hero was the uh was how to handle the whole one hand two hand thing and how to handle um offhand weapons and that's why I went with adept and focus. The idea is some it's either you're good at it or you or you've been you've been spending your your you've been you're good at it, but you've dipped into others or you spend a whole lot more time focusing in this one particular style. Um and as far as um energy style, which that was that was to include the equivalent of the of the of the rate of both the ranged and magic approaches. Mm-hmm. Um, I used that particular. I used the terminology that I did because I was loosely basing it on some of the um, key attack systems I had seen in stuff like Anima and even the even some um, TTRPG adaptations I've seen over the years of Dragon Ball Z. Yeah, uh, oh, I was going to ask on on that as well later because it doesn't seem to fit the the kind of mundane pugilist that you were going for with having those energy styles. So I don't know if it was like. You know, because you could take a bow or some throwing knives, and I think that might fit kind of a pugilist playstyle, maybe a bit more. Um, I didn't. But... I didn't want it. I felt that it. I felt that this is this is something that is go, would lean weapon weaponless, but doesn't necessarily have to be. And this is also why I brought up the um, the way the way things work in Jade Empire because. You have you have the martial styles, you and you have the you have the magic styles, and you have the support styles, um, as well as well as transformation. But that's but that's not something I'm getting into. Um, if somebody asks me how I do transformations, I just say I do it as a keepsake. <laughs> but the but there is still the there is still the there is still the concept of. Of of energy blast that's kind of been in popular culture, and I'm operating under the assumption that somebody may want to incorporate key blast. They may want to do their Hadoken in all but name, and yeah, that's that what that's what the that's what the energy style is for. Um, I mean, hell, in the in um in Jade Empire you're get, you're going to be choosing between one of two energy st- not energy styles one or two um magic styles right out of the gate um either either ice either um either a fire or, or either fire or ice and of course of course there's going to be other ones that as you develop but those but you're going to be picking one of those two right right from the start and be, and um going to be switching between them because of how it works that's so that's kind of further going into that whole thing of somebody who's who's a pugilist in in this setup is going is going to be dabbling into a bunch of different styles especially as they develop. Oh. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I see what you're going on, like the track you're going on, right? Like you're talking like 
<clears throat> okay, so you have the pugilist, right? Like, without the key stuff, you know, the dude is either master of many, many styles, or he's focused, right? My boy is focused, he's straight and narrow, he's doing what it does, right? You have the key in there for individuals who are like, you know what, man? I want a key fighter, right? Because I enjoy the martial arts stuff, right? And I love the objectivity of having this traveling pugilist, right? But I also want to do some casting, you know what I mean? S some stuff that fits with it, but I don't want to be a wizard. Because let's face it, wizards are kind of, you know, they look Aiden, may love them, but no. Nobody likes wizards like that, Aiden, I'm sorry. Ah, see, I love my casters. And you see, and that's why you get punched in the face by a guy who can do it from 20 feet away. This, is a, this like, is a free country, and you are free to be wrong. Yeah, you, okay. you're, you're free to be wrong, okay? That's why we got the rest, oh. of the, the rest of the pugilists. You see what I'm saying? You can get your punches in. You can do casting. You're not a wizard, and you won't die in 10 seconds. Like, it's, it's, it's Papa's kiss, okay? It's, fresh, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. Yeah. Time to make a joke class uh, called Failed Wizard, and it's just a... Uh, like, you know, pugilist that uses a bunch of wizard stuff, you know, throwing That's magic words at people. <laughs> <laughs> That's just Rinswin from Discworld. <laughs> I have not read Discworld. Uh, Discworld is fire. It, it's on my list to read. I've been reading all the Brandon Sanderson stuff at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love I love Sanderson, although although um, if you the best version of his work is the graphic audio versions. Um. Uh, it's basically taking his stuff and turning it into a radio drama. Uh -huh. And I've oh, I love me the radio drama. Um, I've I've had this joke for the longest time of the the Virgin audiobook versus the Chad radio drama. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do like the the drama podcast that I've listened to. I listened to a few oh, yeah. of them. You know, there's been some uh, some good ones to come out uh, uh, recently for on like you know podcast stuff to hear. Um, they had one come out called Batman Unburied. Uh, they had oh, Wilson that, that was real. That was really. Oh my good. god, bro, Aiden, let me tell you something, bro. Okay, because you know I, I travel a hundred miles every day for work. Okay, yeah, that's I was a lot in of that. Miles. Look, don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> My vehicle is being held together by duct tape, hope streams, and Puerto Rican ingenuity, but that's not the point. Okay, the point <laughs> is the story. Okay, the thing is, okay, for those hundred miles for like two straight weeks, I was hooked, bro. My ears was open. One time, my girl called me to make sure I was safe, and I said, "Batman is talking. I will call you back." Hung up. <laughs> now, now, was there an explaining when I got home? For sure. Okay, for sure. But you don't interrupt the Batman. Um, there is. It's cur it's currently between seasons, but there but there is one that I can re that I can recommend, especially if you're a fan of science fiction, and that is um, Continuum Force. The best mm, way for me to describe it is think think of a midway point between Doctor Who and Stargate SG One. I'm in the middle. I've met you there. We can shake hands and we can have lunch there. I love that space. <laughs> uh, but. Getting back, getting back on the pugilist, the the other thing that I I one of the things that I knew I wanted to do to kind of give it its own niche is I wanted the pugilist to be a melee bully, mm -hmm. and since since Ember Wind does does use grid combat, this was the perfect opportunity to take advantage of it because I did double check to see to see if there to see um what the what was there when it came to the ability to push from other classes. Mm -hmm. And that's something that isn't all that touched on with the with the base nine classes in Emberwind. Mm -hmm. And just to make sure, I checked the subclasses. Nope, not not there either. Those are focusing on other motifs. So a lot. Of, so you'll you probably notice this. A lot of the actions have some sort of have some sort of forced movement, but. I felt that that wasn't enough, especially since if if you're dealing with a place where movement is limited, then what then what's going to happen with that? And just having yeah. just having that be wasted didn't seem like enough. And I double and triple checked, and I I think I even asked about this at one point about wall damage because I didn't because I didn't see anything when it came to wall damage. So mm -hmm. I, yeah, so I, so I was like, all all right. Well, all right. That's what. Then we're gonna have to invent wall damage. <laughs> I like it. And B bold men go bold places, sir. Keep going. Mm -hmm. So the 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 idea the idea was the idea with it was to allow was 
the the big thing that the pugilist is go, is going to focus on is mobility and pushing people around. Mm-hmm. So it's it's all about it's all about taking advantage of positioning, which in a lot of games that involve grid combat, you don't see a whole lot of builds that are built around that concept. You saw it a bit more in fourth edition, but it could have it could have gone further. And thirteenth age decided to go a bit more abstract, so that was out. Which is the reason why I di- why I did the wall damage thing, and I know I know that there was a lot of arguing about me bringing <laughs> that keepsake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that that was something is that I just worry that the wall damage by itself uh, is going to be ineffective because it's not piercing damage, and uh, a d six or even like you know a couple d six of damage if it's not piercing is not going to scale very well. Um, mm-hmm. Especially since your pushes don't scale very well, like they're they're pretty static push ranges. Yeah the the appro- the I didn't want I didn't want it to, I didn't want wall damage to be something that you that was to be relied on, just something that mm. provided a little extra. Yeah, um, yeah, like a situational keep, you know, like a situational thing, like oh, I can use wall damage here. You know what I mean? It's appropriate here. Yeah, but like yeah. once you get to uh, some of the later enemies, uh, foes, they have, you know, like, six minimum of, you know, uh, what's it called? Toughness. That's what I'm thinking of. Things yeah. like that. And, like, some of the foes at the end of uh, Skies of Axia would just kind of be uh, almost immune to the wall damage, essentially. Well, there's a, well, there's other, thi- there's other things that can be done um, to, to make up for that. Yeah. So there's there are there are options. Yeah. Oh yeah. The one thing that I knew I knew I always wanted to avoid, and not just not just with this, but in general, is is characters characters of the like that are one trick ponies. I've yeah. made it very clear over over the years how much I absolutely despised the uh, the basic attack fighter. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is, and that is something that I that I wanted to make sure I wanted to make sure I avoided. I will I will admit that going with a martial character made my job a little bit easier because I didn't have to figure out how I was going to scale um, damage dice. Since martial characters, the damage dice is based on your melee weapon or your melee style if you're not using a weapon. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty convenient. Um. I will admit yeah. coming up with tide turners was a bit tricky. Mm-hmm. And cuz I I get the idea of it being of it being powerful, but unlike my own project, I didn't have a a angle on on how I how I'd approach mm-hmm. the how I'd approach the power scaling cuz Part of the part of the reason I haven't up I haven't updated the pugilist in a while is I've been working on a Final Fantasy themed project codenamed FF Legend, mm-hmm. and with that one, the equivalent to Tide Turner would be limit breaks, but instead of having limit breaks be this uber attack, they are designed to be a cheat, mm-hmm. basically a basically a way to do what a particular job um, do, already does, but far be, but far better than normal. Mm-hmm. For the rest of that, for the rest of that encounter, it's it's the equivalent of the game breaker minds um, mindset for the level fourteen abilities in a lot of base classes in fantasy craft. Mm-hmm. No, take you know something something that goes right against one of the fundamental rules of, of the game, but is only available for a limited sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To give you that sense of, you know, of of literal, you know, underdog feel, you know, that rocky moment basically. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like you got it in you. Yeah. Yeah. Know exactly what you mean. Uh now, well, I that's the, that's also the reason why I I don't mind I don't mind the fact that that a good amount of the features do have some limited debuffs. Obviously obviously, um some of the more controller leaning cl- leading um, classes are going to have more debuffs, and it's and um some and then you've then you've got the crazies like like say the Arden who who is like I'm going to set your fire on fire. 
<laughs> Beat that Ardent do be setting things on fire. Mm-hmm. I just like the uh, the thing you got going on. You know what I mean? You yeah. go in there, you mix it up, you're bullying people, you push them against the wall. You know what I mean? If he's too strong, it doesn't matter if it doesn't hurt him. You know why? Yeah. You still pushed him. You got his attention. And if you want yep. some of this meal, you got a buffet, baby, all day long. <laughs> um, I'd say one of the tricky things, that this was something that I know I need to work on, is Emberwin writes its abilities in a very specific manner. And it did take me a while to get out of some bad habits that, that I've had write, writing when it comes to other um, D20-centric fantasy games. Although uh, I, I, will, I will admit that, my, that my, the favorite Tide Turner that I wrote was, um, was, was Duel of Fates. <laughs> it's, a tie, <laughs> it's a tie between that and Everywhere at Once. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one, good references. One, could, could you explain a little bit of what both of those do then? Uh, because I don't um, know. Duel of Fates is a is a sustained type tide turner. Um, targets one, targets one foe and basically creates a three by th three square area centered centered on the foe that gain that gains the gains a local a local field effect called Duel of Fates. Um, the target foe can't it can't leave the field and all other combatants besides yourself. Um, that that um can't can't uh, can't tar can't target the field. It's ba it basically locks the field in, and it's and two men enter, one man leaves. There can only be one. Mm hmm. I like Let's it. See. It is it is a to balance to balance that out. Um, it's a slow plus slow action. <laughs> so uh -huh. you're spending your whole round you're spending your whole round setting this up, but afterwards. The two of the two of you are in a, are in a one on one fight, and you can neither of you can leave, and no and nobody else can help. Yeah, um, that, that's well, kind of like. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to say just uh, just uh, just, uh, just you know just talk about thematic thematically that just sounds amazing. Yeah, I wanted to invoke the emo the motif of say of say the Mustafar fight in Revenge of the Sith or any. Any fight, any fight in a burning temple that you see in any samurai movie. Oh yeah, I get you. I get you. Oh, and what were you uh, on, Aiden? I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Mister. Oh, I, I was just gonna say that's funny because it's the like I have the exact opposite ability in my class, uh, chess master, mm -hmm. where you basically can target one foe and neither of you can target each other. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, because because you designate both yourself and that foe as a king, and then chess. You, you can't kill a king with a king. Yeah, that's a good foil. Um, and everywhere at everywhere at once just ha just has just ha just makes it ridiculously easy to teleport to anywhere in a fi in a um five by five square area centered on you. So and any time any time somebody tries to hit you, if you if you succeed on the def on defense, then you can teleport right to them. Doesn't oh, yeah. as long as long as they're as long as they're within that um, zone, ob obviously. Man, uh, the pugilist is uh, bringing DoorDash to Emberwin, uh, serving these hot hands <laughs> in fifteen minutes or less <laughs> in a five by five square. Yeah, <laughs> you too can receive these discounts. <laughs> yeah, there are there are a few anti range. Um, ab abilities with abilities within it, and I did I did abuse some form of um, of teleporting with several abilities, along with along with a handful of ones that are meant to be simultaneous move and attacks. Mm -hmm. The the key, th I would if when it comes to the, when it comes to the whether I'd cons whether I consider um, pugilist a a basic or a more advanced one. This is. This isn't the. One, I wouldn't exactly recommend giving the pugilist to the rookie. Um, this is for yeah. so, this is for the kind of person who has an understanding of um, how how to best take advantage of the area. If they're the type of person who just who just run who just tries to run in and 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 pummel, um, mm -hmm. might be better to give them the warrior than give them pugilist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, you can still use the weaponless hero stuff with other classes like the warrior as well. And that could fit their concept better, for yeah. example, or like the rogue. Yeah. And I, know? I, um, I know that, I know that you had, had mentioned what, why not use the, why not use the advanced equipment? Um, I didn't, I wanted to operate on as little assumptions as I could. Yep. Cause if I, cause, um, if I use the advanced equipment, that's that would be then that would operate under the assumption that whoever is using this class would have that as well, and I didn't like doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, that was something that we did actually in our last podcast episode uh, last month. We did we did uh, character building, yes, and we, we built uh, Louis's recurring character, uh, Mister Big, Mr. who Big. is a you know big brute. Uh, bruiser type guy. And Nothing so... about the jar of dead bees. <laughs> uh, yeah, his keepsake was a jar of dead bees, but he thought they were alive. Because... There's family. Because he he said that he shakes the jar, and if they move, they're they're fine. And yeah, you know, when, when you shake the jar, that they all move, <laughs> even though they're dead. Um, they're moving in spirit. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> so yeah, so we built that character, and that was I think we did. Warrior, right? With that, mm -hmm. warrior, and and we did use the weaponless hero rules from yours because he wanted to be unarmed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we kind of mix and match those. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, now I will. Ad one thing that I, one thing that I do want to expand upon down the road because I think I think it's something that hasn't that its full potential hasn't been completely tapped yet is util utilizing utilizing keepsakes to be, to be the be the equivalent of learn of learning a special technique as if in a lot of in a lot of martial arts fiction and a lot of a, a lot of anime and what have you um you will have that you'll have that particular arc where somebody um spends t spends time with a master and then learns a technique And I think that in fourth edition, th this was dipped into with the idea of alternative rewards. Okay, uh, I'm not familiar with those. This was something that was brought it that was brought into the was brought into D and D fourth edition through the um, second DM's guide. The idea with the idea with it was it was that these were ways to do magic item like rewards that weren't magic items uh, these could be things like divine boons or more particularly in this case um martial techniques and i thought it was an interesting concept it's just one that because of, because of the way things went down with fourth edition um wasn't able to be fully explored Mm -hmm. And it, I think it could be it, done with keepsakes. I mean, you could also, um, I mean, keepsakes tend to be more of like a once per combat or once per milestone kind of thing. Um, I don't know, maybe like a full subsystem could be cool as well. I don't know if you've thought about that or. Um, I've given, I've given it some thought, but my mindset is if I can, if I can, Utilize if I can utilize what's already there. I'd rather do that than add. Mm -hmm. Like I did, I I actually had a a system in an early draft that was this martial arts creation mechanic, but it was getting a it was getting away from me. So in, instead, I decided to pivot towards the towards the reskinning the equipment so that it fit it it fit in without needing to. Add a whole new subsystem. Yeah, but I think having optional subsystems for those—I mean, uh, like who want it? Uh, because like Emberwind is all about having these optional subsystems. Uh, like we have the deck of fates and the cantrip cards, and those all add new things to the game mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, but you can still play it entirely without them, or you can mix and match. So they're supposed to be balanced with, uh, like you know, a player who isn't using those as well. Yeah, my m mindset was I did was I didn't want to 
create create a subsystem within the within the class within the classes because the subsystems are already present for Emberwind. They're they're a pivot to the side, not not a pivot up or down. Oh, um, I wasn't thinking of like specifically for the class. I was thinking like you know you could just add in that alternative rewards kind of thing that you were saying for mm -hmm. everyone. It could be fighting styles for your your pugilist. Or it could be divine boons, anything like that. Anything that you know. Well, that's that's and, why I wanted. That's why I wanted to use keepsakes at in it be, for it because that's something that's already present. Even even with the limited even with the limited use, there's there's ways to there's ways to build around that. Yeah. And um, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, you, I was going to change the topic a little bit. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, um, I was just going to say, speaking of like these other, you know, added rule things, um, I had actually gotten a question recently from uh, the Distal's Place crew, um, which was that, you know, pushing foes that are larger than yourself. There's currently no sized rules in Emberwind. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if you had any opinions on that. Like if you had an enemy that's, you know, a two by two square or a three by three square on the map, should a push be able to push them as far as it would push a one by one square uh, foe. In my playtests, the approach the approach I've taken is is ye is yes for now. Um, it is it is something I would have it is something I would have to give some thought to. Uh, especially especially since the the size diff the. If I were to take it in the traditional route, then it would it would make pushing out, outright useless. the The approach that I that I was considering, though I'm not a hundred percent on, is um, big is bigger enemies take more wall damage. You know, because you know, because more masses yeah. get more masses is getting talked yeah. about. Um, Makes sense. On the on the other hand, I may say screw it and, ju and just ha and just have it be universal to account for uh, to account for some for the for the motif of the the big muscle guy getting getting outplayed by somebody who looks smaller. Um, there's a, there's yeah. there are a hand there are a handful of those kind of stories in the early days of UFC where yes yeah. where um somebody who looked like they're on the bottom but was but was really doing a triangle choke. Mm -hmm. um, it's it seemed like they're at a disadvantage and then the guy on top starts tapping oh yeah or how you have how you have one particular character in the anime baki the grappler who look who is not as muscled out as everybody else but mm -hmm. because of the fact that he's more of a adept with aikido his his mindset is i'm going to i'm going to turn your own strength against you and that's exactly what he does mm-hmm Okay, yeah, because they had uh, they aren't using the pugilist, but there are other classes that do push, and so they it had come up in their uh, stream that they do um, that you know it seemed odd that they were pushing this giant centipede thing um, or whatever you know just as far as they would push a, a human. Hey man, I would just you know role play that that character has that dog in him because let me tell you something, <laughs> I ain't pushing no giant centipede. The hell you think this is? Okay, I got work tomorrow. I'll die. But <laughs> <laughs> you can push the centipede. <laughs> I will always be in favor of embra of embracing the ridiculous, because mm -hmm. a big part of my philosophy is believability over realism. Mm. And let let's consider the let's consider the fact that if you want if you watch enough lucha, you will see some crazy crazy gimmicks. Hell, even if you just watched Lucha Underground while that was on the air, you would see some cra Fire. you would see some crazy, crazy gimmicks. But it's presented in a way where you can go along with it, and that's mm -hmm. the motif that I, that I like to go with. The I'm not in it for realism. If you want, if you want that, you're in the wrong game. There are mm -hmm. more, there are games that are more realism leaning and more simulationist. I got no nothing wrong with those games. It's just I like variety. Yeah. And in something like em in something like Emberwind, I'd want to reward people for doing over the doing over the top stuff because 
you're supposed to be on some level heroes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as far as the as far as the whole thing of of pushing around the centipede, I'm like, no, you can you can push it. And if anybody asks why, it's just you're that friggin' good. Yeah, you're that good, yeah. you know. But like the same, you know, on like the same note, you know, like if they were up against like like a stone golem, you know what I mean? Ain't nobody pushing shit because it's a stone golem. You know what I, I mean? mean hey. No, I'd still have it, I still have it be pu- I still have it be pushable. Yeah, unless oh, it has like a, a characteristic that says it's unable to be affected by force movement mm. or you know, that that hey. is something you could do. Mm-hmm. Then I guess they just always got that dog in them. I like that. I like that. Just, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so like you got Stone Gollum would be actually a good one where you would add like a characteristic that says yeah. that they're you know they can't be pushed around. You no know, movable or something like that. Van Diesel. Yeah. You know something that says he's bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but in ge- in general, the I will. I want I want people to come to come away from the table with some cr- with some crazy story of things that either went really well or re- or really terribly or both. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and you want to be you want to be cool, like especially with Emberwind, it's a system that's you know designed around making your characters feel cool. Mm-hmm. Um. Although, if I can go back to some of the martial arts influence a bit real quick, uh, we did have a question from DJ Dizzy in the, the chat, uh, wondering if um, you've heard of or will be incorporating anything from Mu Duck Quan. I, I probably said that completely wrong. I already more or less answered that with how, with how I design uh, okay. the, the, martial, the martial arts system in that. I'm not desi- I'm not designing with any specific martial art in mind. The idea is to create a is to create a sandbox yeah. for people to fill that in because um let's say that you're let's say that you're use let's say that you're using the pugilist in the campaign setting um that that you kind of see with Skies of Axia. Um who's to say that the martial art styles in that world mirror ours? That's yep, exactly that what you're saying. That's exactly what you're saying. You know what I mean? Because a lot of martial arts is is cultural and 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 developed for a reason. You know what I mean? A response to something. So it would be different. You have a diff. You have a different environment, and be and because of that, these st- these styles are going to ch- these styles are going to change. Um, like let's to use an to use a real world example of what I'm going with. Let's consider the difference between. Um, northern and southern styles of kung fu. A lot of the northern styles usually inv- involve a lot of a lot of lo- a lot of um, reach-based strikes, whereas a mm-hmm. lot of southern style is a whole. Def- it has it. It has its strikes, but it's strikes that are meant to take advantage of being in close. And a big reason for that is a lot of people who would who would develop the northern styles were taller. And had and had longer reach, and that yeah. style was meant to take advantage of that. Oh yeah, it makes sense a lot. You know what I mean? Like I mean, it's like that was like a lot of martial arts styles. Um, I mean, like even with uh, like with modern boxing, right? Like uh, like um, what they call like slugger st- style or like or like street style developed from fighting in in, in small close knit alleys. You know what I mean? Like you didn't have all this sparse room of of uh, of being able to spread your arms out or even fully extend punches. So they got real good at fighting, you know, shoulder to shoulder, close, close. Um, yeah. Another, 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 the other thing that I, that is something that I find very interest is something I find very interesting to explore. And it's something that I'd want to explore in my own, in my own work is how do mar- how do martial arts develop in a setting where magic exists? In one of the campaign settings that I'm that I'm writing, codename Project Gaia. Um, Hello, did you cut out? No. Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering the same. Am I back? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you are. You left us just for a moment. Sorry about that. I was say- I was saying that th- that um within the Gaia setting that I've 
been developing. Um, there's a group of people known as censors who had developed a martial arts style that is not des- that is not designed to directly attack the body, but directly attack the ma- the magical ability of mages. They're sent. They're essentially anti mages who are who act as a magic inquisition. Because every ma- every mage within one of the cities agrees to a set of rules known as the cipher, and if you violate those rules, um, you might you you might de- you might deal with getting a getting a dressing down from from your peers about it. And if you really violate the rules, especially when it comes to either necromancy or blood magic, then a censor will come after you, and they are and they have trained their whole lives to hunt down and capture mages. Um, if I were to use a video game sense of it, they don't, they don't, when they hit you, they don't attack your HP, they attack your MP. If that, I actually if like that. that. I actually like that a lot, okay. you know what I mean? Because you like siphoning the magic power from them, and then when they have nothing, you then proceed to show them uh, who Steven Seagal was in person. <laughs> It's uh, well, who Steven Seagal claimed to be because yeah, yeah, who Steven Seagal <laughs> claimed to be. <laughs> I suppose if I have to if I have to use a better example, it's it's like um, it's like tr- it's like trying to trying to trying to trying to spend a weekend with Minoru Suzuki, mm-hmm. who has who has gained the affectionate nickname of the Murder Grandpa. Interesting. <laughs> or. If or um po- or possibly spending a weekend with Judo Joe, um God rest his soul. God rest his soul. But you know the the point is is we've we've had plenty of settings over over the years in fantasy fiction of how ma- of how magic works alongside um, emerging technologies. Mm-hmm. Ma- the concept of magitech is something that is se- has been seen quite a bit in fiction. Um, especially mm-hmm. in what I call console style RPGs because I hate the term JRPG. <laughs> mm-hmm. But when it comes to how fighting styles might develop, there seem everybody seems to have this idea that they would develop the same way as they would normally. But you have this whole you have this whole new avenue of of um combat and the, and a way to and a way to approach things. And I find I find it a bit I find it a bit odd that that is something that would not be t- would not be taken advantage of. I I am somebody who who wants to see a an in- a megalobox style harness mm-hmm. in a steam in a steampunk setting. In fact, I I love uh-huh. the um, gear things that were that was in the anime megalobox because that's exactly the kind of thing I'm I'm looking for. See, I haven't watched that one yet either. I I have so much stuff on my. What's that about? What's that about? Give me uh, yeah. Give me a thirty second, forty second synopsis. Megalo Box is first off, it was it was made to be a um cele- celebration. I think it was the ninetieth anniversary of the manga um, Ashita no Jo, which is what, which was a very long running boxing manga back in the day. And the i the idea is. A um, is you have the you have these essentially ge- essentially gear like set like setups for for boxing matches mm-hmm. in order in order to enhance in order to enhance punches and the like. Um, the protagonist, originally known as Junk Dog, had ta- had taken was was known for these known for doing bo- boxing matches in these underground rings. But he ends up he ends up using an opportunity to get into the big city under the name Joe to compete in what's the biggest boxing tournament ever held. I like this so far. I'm a big fan of boxing. Continue. Uh, there's there's a whole lot there's a whole lot more involved, and and you asked me for the quickest summary I can give you. So uh, well, that's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we do I got have to. Up. I got caught up. <laughs> we do have to wrap up. Uh, soon, uh, we're we're hitting our hour and a half limit that we kind of wanted to set for ourselves. Um, but I do just kind of you speaking on all of the uh, you know emergent fighting styles and things like that. Um, does remind me that I should probably uh, ask you you know later. I, I have a project that I'm working on um, using the Rise engine. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's going to be magic tech with you know a bunch of advanced technology kind of thing. 
um, just exploring how, uh, you know, a, a technology advance, like magic advances similar to technology. And so that might be something I might have you help with if, you know, if you'd be willing to at some point. I'm certain I'm all, I'm always open to help to helping out. That's I always I always like it when um when a deve- when a developer of something looks through either one of my reviews or um Valley of the Judged and ad- and adjusts um accordingly to some, mm-hmm. to something I said. One of the big examples is when um when I was going through a very interesting 5e hack called Heavens and Heresies, which Full disclosure: the the developer of it is somebody I've in, I've interviewed and, and I'm on good terms with. Um, we were going through the um, Berserker class, which is basically there. Basically, it's equivalent to a barbarian. And one thing I one thing I note one thing I noticed was the class was giving me so many flashbacks to guts from the berserk an- anime and manga especially the manga obviously cuz i'd like to not think about the last time somebody tried to do berserk in anime form thank you but we had made the remark of it's very mu- it's very clearly invoking this why don't why don't we have an option for those who want to wear armor but still be a berserker mm-hmm. because the way that it was written at the time it was assuming that you weren't wearing armor, so it was giving you bonuses for that. And I guess I guess Tanner, the developer, agreed with us because in the next update, that's exactly what he put in a alternate version of the unarmored um, fighter um, feature that was in the thing. For if you want to wear armor, this is these are the bonuses you get instead. Yeah, that makes sense. Um. Yeah, so like I mentioned, uh, we're getting close to that time. So a couple final questions, I think, um, just kind of, uh, you know, I was I was wondering what kind of future projects. I know you mentioned the, I think, Gaia, you had said um, mm-hmm. things like that that you're kind of working on that you want to, you know, get out there. But if it's secret, you don't you don't have to tell us. No, 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 you have to. Tell <laughs> OK, OK. You there's... Take all your secrets. There's there's a few. I don't exact. I don't exactly hide much. There's there's a few things that I'm working on. As I mentioned before, one of them is the FF Legend project, which is us taking Legend system, heavily modifying it, um, filing off a lot of the 3.5 D and D stuff of it, and building it around doing a Final Fantasy themed um, game. The key thing is that we're not trying to draw upon one particular entry in the series, we are looking at the franchise as a whole and drawing upon its mythos. Because I had a lot of people saying, are you are you basing it on tactics? Are you basing it on seven? The answer is yes. As far as what, and more specifically, the answer is I'm putting that in the hands of the table. Um, okay. In addition to that, um, a while back, I had, cov- I had covered the Power Rangers RPG, and there were a lot of stuff in it that really pissed me off, especially since I knew that it was going to be some people's introduction to role-playing. Some people who were fans of Power Rangers would pick it up, be completely confused by, by parts of the book, and may, and may drop the hobby entirely, and that would not sit with me. So, so I, deci- I decided to... Um, do a reconstruction of the of the base rules with a mechanic I'm calling Essence Trinity, it's, um, playing off of the Essence Twenty system that it that it was using that they made for it, and on, honest, honestly feels like it was supposed to be D and D Five E for the longest time, and then pivoted at the last minute. But in addition to that, some of the some of the stuff that I've explored in in previous episodes of Geek Watch, I am in the process of developing. Um, I want one of those things is a micro setting called Agito Arcanum, which we did an episode of on, on the podcast where we developed the idea. The core concept is taking take is is taking the Hero Academy motif that you see in in various in various anime and manga. As well as the disappointment that is Strixhaven, and doing our own spin on it. The idea that this is a this is a school for adventurers in training. 
up. Mm-hmm. And of of course, I'm still do, I'm still doing Geek Watch. We're actually doing um, a reconstruction of Dragon Age Two this Sunday, so that's something to keep an eye out for. And um, we're starting the next se- the next season proper of Valley of the Judge this Friday, covering the sci-fi RPG Faith, which allows me to hit two notches Ooh. because one Zan wa- Zan my co-host wanted to do wanted to do something a bit more space opera. And two, we're doing something that in, that utilizes cards instead of, instead of dice because that's something that I feel has not been fully explored. Mm. And the cantrip, the cantrip cards, that doesn't count. Nor, <laughs> yeah, so, nor does the <laughs> de- nor does the um, nor does that uh, nor does that other that other deck type that's in Emberwind. Those those are optional. Yeah. I'm talking I'm talking stuff like the saga like the saga system from Dragonlance Fifth Age or Against the Dark Yogi where you're where the cards are the primary mechanic. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah. not something like Savage Worlds where cards are more you know no, even Savage Worlds isn't, that's just initiative, I think. It's a um, it's a neat way to do initiative, but Savage Worlds does not count. Um there is like Gloomhaven, I think, where you have ability card like decks. Yeah, ability um, decks and cards. Yeah, like but that's a Gloomhaven is first off Gloomhaven's a board game, not an RPG. Yes. And second off, the 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 cards in that are too proprietary. Mm-hmm. All the ones that I mentioned before utilize some variation of what you'd playing expect card. from a playing card deck. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was actually what was it? I went to the playthrough convention recently, and I picked up this book called Necrobiotic. Oh yeah, um, I'm familiar have, with them. Okay, yeah, I, I saw them there, and I got the you know their special edition. But it seems to use cards and stuff. But I haven't yeah. read through it. Fully it yet. Uh, it does. I I backed it. I've in, I've interviewed the developers. One of them is kind of on the weird end of things. And um, <laughs> calling people out. <laughs> oh, I, love I, it. I, I call it. I call everybody out. <laughs> doesn't oh, matter how. Gonna have drama. Matter. So, uh, just, just, to, just have them direct their hate. Just have them direct their hate mail my way. I, I'm, I'm already, I'm already, on, I'm already on the outs because I keep pick because I keep poking fun at um, at at certain. At, cer- at certain crowds, I've I've said on mu- I've said on multiple occasions the grogs can kiss my ass. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I I cur- I I've cur- I've cursed I've cursed out I've cursed out some some de- some de- some developers for do- for making really stupid moves. I don't want I don't want to name names, but one of them I <laughs> called a pencil neck geek with a weird physique. <laughs> um, oh, that's mean. And. I've and I've had I've had my instances of of um of get of getting on the case of some very of some very popular entries. Um, Evil Hat Games has been my whipping boy for over a de- for about a decade now. Mm-hmm. Uh, with so, with some rare exceptions, there's some there's some problems I have with the fate system, but that's another story <laughs> and. Um, some people really don't like the really don't like my significant distaste for the phrase JRPG, even uh-huh. though I've explained on, on multiple occasions why I don't like that phrase and why I use the terms console style and PC style. And the fact that the fact that back in the day I had the gall to um t- to admit that I take inspiration from anime and manga when it comes to the, when it comes to how I design my games and how I design my campaigns as as well, because I could see the writing on the wall. Okay. Um. Yeah. So then, I guess the kind of final things um, would be, you know, I, I'm trying to close this up here. Uh, you have any? Uh, or sorry, what? Where, where can we find you? Like, uh, viewers, find you. Um, listeners, I guess. Um. If you search up Mildra on you on YouTube, you should be able to find me. Um, I am in the process of changing that so it's Mildra the monk, so I don't get confused with some pop singer I've never heard of. Mm-hmm. That's or, that's terrible to be losing to somebody you never even heard of. It's just, it's there if you if you uh, there I'm also I'm also on t- on Twitter under Mildra the monk. Um, 
some some of the stuff some of my stuff can get a bit spicy that there so so you have been warned those are the two primary ways on on how to reach out obviously i have obviously i have my own discord and a lot of a lot of those further links are in are on the pinned um tweet on my on my twitter profile uh I don't have I don't have a whole lot of I don't have a whole lot of other um, ave- avenues. Those are those are the main two. I I am in the process of I'm in the process of expanding, but that's the main way to do it. I had a Twitch channel for a while, but I didn't like I didn't like what Twitch was turning into, so I haven't used that in years. Mm-hmm. There's also yeah. the fact that I didn't want to walk on eggshells regarding what kind of music I pl- I play for my videos, and I never have any intention of monetizing my channel, anyways. No, I get that 110. Okay. percent yeah, and then, uh, of course, you can also find your Embro and stuff here in the fan content forum mm-hmm. of this Discord, uh, the Embro and Discord. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, and then uh, Louis has some other closing. Did you have any other? I have one final, one final thing. Well, one final thing, really. Because you, so you've played many an RPG, right? Yes. Okay. So, quickly. What is your favorite character death or favorite crazy character that you've had? Oh no. Oh, we gotta keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> um favorite character death. That that goes to that goes to the dragon incident. Oh my. Because I I des- I designed a magic item that was called that was a rune trap called the up button. Because I because I take way too I get way too many inspira- inspirations for traps through um the work of Chuck Jones, you know, Looney Tunes. Yeah. You step on the trap, you go up. <laughs> Straight up for six seconds at 40 miles an hour. For those of you who for those of you who use KPH, figure it out on your own. And end of the campaign. We're dealing with a. We are we are dealing with a. Um, somebody this somebody ends up stepping on this thing by accident on one of the traps. Um, one of the later ones did get the did get the dragon who was later crushed to death. But you said character death. Yeah. Um, and actually, this this other person ended up ended up getting crushed to death because what happened was the walls of the cave were lined with adamantite. That uh, stuff isn't budging. So yeah. he hits this. He hits the ceiling. But that's only one second. He still has he still has five more to go. <laughs> and it, there isn't there isn't a contingency of you stop when you hit something. No, you keep you keep go you keep going until the six seconds are up. So you ever see you ever see a car in a compactor? Yeah, yeah, in that's what happened to him. Oh my god! Now you turn somebody to a fucking granola bar. <laughs> Hell of a death. He he wasn't a granola he wasn't a granola bar he was he was just meat sauce it was like was op- a, it was like opening up a can of Prego. Oh my God! Sloppy point, Joe seconds to the point where everybody had to take Constitution saves so they didn't lose their lunch. Fucking dragon is like, what the fuck did you do? Yeah, and then <laughs> and then and then thirty minutes later he falls for the same thing because it's not like I put multiple traps or anything. Um, there was a minor one where some where. Somebody took the sonic air, the sonic arrow that that I had, um, that I had developed for for the party. Didn't re- had had ignored my warning when I said this thing has kickback, because I had based the concept of it on the noisy cricket from Men in Black. Oh yeah, does a hell of a lot of damage, but you are going to be sent flying. And the mm-hmm. rule with this was, you fire the thing, you fly, you get pushed back. Um, twenty feet in the opposite direction, and you cannot reduce this. Well, he ends up do he ends up using this. He pushes himself right off the cliff. <laughs> I, I see, you know, equal and opposite forces and everything. Yeah, and then he then he gets then he gets mad at me, and I'm like, I warned you this was going to happen. I just. I told I told you you shoot this you shoot this thing it's going to do a whole lot of damage but you're going to be sent flying. Hey man, some folks don't like to listen. They just got to be taught. Story story of every time I've had I've had people play Infinity at my LGS for the first time. 
They always think, oh, it's a, it's a mini war game. I'll I'll just do an open charge, and then they get then they get filled with bullets. Because <laughs> Infinity has that rule of when you activate a unit, any opposing unit that has line of sight gets a free shot. Hey man, that's a good Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah for you right there. <laughs> but that that's is that's when it comes to character death. As far as as far as character, there was there was one there was one time um there was one time I, I made a half orc who half orc monk who instead was um was a full on lucha. At, instead of instead of having a magic item, he had a he had a um he had a he had a mask which since he's a lucha he never took off. Of course. Um, any any time any time that he would leap, he would always find ways to pose right in the middle of the air while shouting about the honor of the mask. He because of the fact that he rolled a natural twenty, he German suplexed a dragon in the air. You know when you German suplex a dragon in the air, you for sure know what the hell you're doing. Um. There, there was, there was the, there was the fact that, he, because he was half orc, he, he was like, he was like seven feet, he was like seven feet tall, and, and, co- and um, co- and called himself Shark. <laughs> oh, I love it, I love it. He's the man after my own heart. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of because of characters myself. Because I, I was listening to Fast as a Shark by Accept when I was writing the character, and I was trying to, I was trying to come up with a name, and. I, and I hear that song in my playlist, and I'm like, "Well, that's it. He's just, he's shark." That's how it works, brother. Inspiration comes to us in the greatest ways. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, I think our time has been up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. I want to thank our guest, Mildred. Bro, it's been great talking to you. Uh, yeah, we you. definitely gotta gotta keep it up sometime. <laughs> uh, talk more martial arts for sure. <laughs> but uh, I've been Louis. This has been Aiden, and of course, got to. Aiden, what's that magic word? What's that magic? Uh, Go ahead, get the little sum sum. What? <laughs> you mean? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, we have uh, our offer, ten uh, percent off, uh, to use at the uh, Emberwind store. Uh, and that's oh, EmberwindGame.com, right? Yeah, that's what you meant. I see. Mm-hmm. Yes, EmberwindGame.com, I believe, is the website. Yeah. Yes, and then you go ahead and you enter it on the rise. You get a nice ten percent off the entire order. Can't beat that. Can't beat that. So if you don't have the game, just go ahead and gives you a little extra, uh, you know, some something to help you out. Uh, so you can go ahead, you can get it, and you can follow along with us. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, you guys have a good night. Listeners, you have a good night. Be easy, and we'll see y'all next time. Okay. Yeah. See ya. Um. Okay. So then we'll have it edited out there. So. uh... Mildred, you do a lot of interviews. Uh, how was that? <laughs> we're, we're new to this, so. Oh, uh, you get you guys did fine. Oh, uh, by the way, do I do I need to have Craig open still, or is it done? Uh, no, you can close it. Oh no! All right. Um, I still have it recording in here, but I can stop that. Uh, yeah, let me do that real quick. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I, no, you guys didn't. You-